Hey guys, so in this video, I'm gonna be going over frequently asked questions. So I'll put them on the screen here, what questions I'm gonna be covering in this video. And these aren't always frequently asked questions. Sometimes it just might be subjects I think might be interesting to people. So without a super long intro, let's get started. Can the Flex Boss output on its load port while it's attached to the grid boss. So the official answer from EG4 is that's not a supported action and uh, you know use the ports on the grid boss for that. But yes, it can. Actually, I'll show you guys on the load port, it is hot. So this is the Flex Boss 21. And you just still have power here on the load ports. So even though it's considered in hybrid mode now because it is sending its power back from the grid port to the grid boss. But you do have power here on these ports. Also, the output numbers probably aren't gonna be accurate if you are powering anything from the load port since all the info is supposed to be going through the grid boss. So that's probably why they say that as far as not supported. So yeah, I would just use the ports in the grid boss if it were me. So you do still have split phase power on the load port, but I don't really know why you'd do that anyway. I mean, it's an interesting question, but you basically have everything you'd need on the grid boss. And I covered this in another video, but between backup loads, non-backup loads, I really don't see why, and, it's, and with the smart ports too, I don't see why you'd need to use the load port on the flex boss. But yeah, I mean, it does work. Like I said though, EG4's official answer is, hey, use the grid boss, that's not supported. All right, next question, question number two, right? This is number two? Yeah, number two is PV voltage on EG4 inverters. So I do get a lot of questions on how I would put an array on each inverter or how many panels could I put on this. And EG4 actually has a calculator now. So you guys can put in the specific type of inverter you're trying to work with. And then you can put in the panels and it'll help you kind of figure your strings for your area because in a colder area, the voltage is gonna spike higher and you don't wanna go above that uh, maximum PV voltage. And amperage isn't going to be as big of a concern to people because the inverter is only going to use as much amperage as it needs. So voltage, if you look at the off-grid inverter line on EG4, the yellow one is the only different one there. So that actually is a bit of an older model and that goes to 500 volts VOC. So maximum voltage that can, it can handle on solar is 500 volts with that unit. Moving on from there, the 6,000 XP, the 12,000 XP, both are 480 volts VOC. So again, I would use that calculator, but depending on your area, you're gonna wanna stay well below that 480. An actual usable range on the 6,000 XP and 12,000 XP is 120 volts up to 385 volts. So anything above that 385 range, you're really not gonna get much benefit from it anyway. So staying in there, probably staying around 400 volts. And then 120 is low in my opinion. So it's barely gonna turn on at that point. You want your VOC, you want your voltage on your panels as you wire them in series to be above 150, 180. Really, it's nice to be around the 200 range. That's a pretty common question that I get. I see issues with that with people. You, you wanna stay above what you think is the minimum. Some people will wire three panels together and they say, well, I'm right around 125 volts VOC. Why isn't it working? Or it takes it forever. It's like midday before it actually turns on. So that's another thing to consider. So in the hybrid EG4 inverters, the 12 kPV, the 18 kPV, the two flex bosses behind me here, the 18 and the 21, 600 VOC is the limit on these. So they can go up to 600 volts, which makes it a whole lot easier to wire your panels in. Because you can have a whole lot of panels in series if you have a VOC at that limit. Something to consider... Ugh. Something to consider though, the 12 kPV, the 18 kPV, both had a usable range. They went from 120 volts, just like the off-grid inverters, up to 500 volts of usable range. The newer ones, the flex bosses, go up to 450, I think. Just had to look. It's 440. So yeah, both of these are at 440 volts. The 18 kPV and the 12 kPV are at 500 volts. The amperage limit did go up on these though, so you're not going to have any problem getting to the numbers. But yeah, keep that in mind with the voltage. It did change on these newer models. Having said that though, my largest array is wired into the FlexBoss 18, and it's wired right around 500 VOC or maybe just a smidge more. 
and I haven't seen any losses in it since I switched from the 18k PV. So they may just be a little more conservative with their numbers on these newer MPPTs, but yeah, it's still making the maximum amount of power, same exact power it was when it was hooked to the 18k PV. So I think they're just being a little bit conservative on their voltage numbers for these MPPTs. Again, last thing I would say on that is if you guys have any questions on how many strings, how many panels to put in a string, go to that calculator. I'll leave a link in the description to that so you guys can check that out on how to wire your panels up to any of the EG4 inverters. This next one isn't actually EG4 specific, but it's people asking, how do I wire in different batteries with my EG4 batteries? So that might not be different batteries all together or different brands. It might be a wall mount with rack batteries or something along those lines. And I've showed that in the past. They recommend having three rack batteries. So I have three LLS batteries teamed up with a wall mount battery. So that's what they recommend to keep them balanced. Personally though, I've tried mix and match all type of different scenarios and it seems to work either way. When you reach that top charge, they all end up there together. When you discharge, you'll see them at different levels. When they get all the way to the bottom, they'll be at the same level. So it seems to work either way. But yeah, they recommend having three rack batteries per wall mount battery. But then the second thing would be if somebody is getting an off-brand battery or they found some on Marketplace and they want to just add them to, and they've already got a previous, previously bought some EG4 batteries, whether it be the wall mount batteries or rack batteries, and they want to be able to add them to that. So that's why I have this here. But the first thing to note would be you're not gonna have communication with an off-brand battery. So that part is out the window. You're not gonna need that. You're not gonna be hooking in comms cables to any of the EG4 batteries. The chances of it, uh, even if it has the, that's another thing to cover, even if it has the same protocol. So let's say they're both on Pylon Tech or something like that. They're both on EG4, whatever you wanna say, they're not gonna communicate with each other. Whether they can communicate with an inverter or not is a different story but the batteries communicating together is different. So battery to battery is different than battery to inverter. So if you say, well, this, uh, I don't know, pick Vatra or whatever is set to pylon tech and my EG4 rack battery is set to pylon tech, but they're not communicating to each other. And that is the case. Yeah, you're not gonna have, they're different BMSs. They're speaking a different language. So with communications out, how are you hooking the batteries in? The batteries can hook to the EG4 batteries in parallel, positive to positive, negative to negative, and they will charge and discharge. If the EG4 batteries have communication, another off-brand can go behind them and hooked in with, like I said, positive, positive, negative, negative in parallel, and it'll still discharge and charge with the other batteries. The inverter is only going to see the EG4 batteries if you've got six rack batteries and they're all hooked into communication. It's only gonna say 600 amp hours worth of storage, but you might've bought 12 other off-brand batteries and hooked them in parallel. So that, it, it still works. It can still charge and discharge, but it'll never see those other batteries. I always recommend installing a T-Class fuse. Now the fuse size is going to depend on, depend on your wire size, and it's also gonna depend on the inverter. So your wire size is determined by the inverter and how much it's gonna pull as far as amperage and then the fuse size would be determined off of that. So most of my banks are, my battery banks are coming off and they're using 4 ot to go over to a main bus bar in there. Some of them are 2 ot but most are 4 ot And I use a 300 amp T-class fuse. So this is a large breaker here that I have. It's just a 200 amp, but this is nice to isolate the system and it can also trip in the case you have gone over current, but a lot of times that's not gonna catch something quick enough. It's like a, a thermal runaway. I would prefer to have a T-Class fuse. Your batteries, most of them are going to have a breaker on them by now anyway. So I prefer ha to have something like this isolating my new battery bank. So if you guys are add adding uh, a Vatra or an eco-worthy battery bank to your existing bank, then put a fuse in between. Um, and depending on your wire size, you might put a 200 amp T-class fuse. If something were to happen, if there were an issue, this is going to pop, a T-class fuse is going to pop immediately if you go over the current that it's rated for, and it will isolate that bank completely. So exactly how to add these batteries to your existing bank is going to vary, because if you have rack batteries, 
like I have a cabinet, I have a couple cabinets over here. Then you may have a large bus bar on there. Then you might just be able to attach to that large bus bar and everything will still run the same. You might have wall mount batteries and you want to install central bus bars like I have in here. They're in this cabinet here. I have a pair of 600 amp bus bars, but I can give you guys an example here in just a second. A good example of what I'm talking about with isolating the batteries. I have this cabinet here with various types of batteries. It does have a Life Power 4 battery in it. We have Eco Worthy, MK Energy, and so on. Those are tied to these 1,000 amp bus bars right here, and so is this little battery right here. But I have these bus bars so I can put a charge verter on the system, so I can test other batteries on the system. So it's helpful to have some central bus bars to be able to hook different packs into if you're gonna be adding batteries on. And then tied into the positive bus bar is the T-Class fuse, like I mentioned before. This is four aught cable, and that entire pack, if it were to exceed 300 amps, this fuse would pop and it would be completely isolated from the system. Or if you've got a cabinet of Life Power 4 batteries like this, and you've, they've already have built in bus bars right here. These are 600 amp bus bars. So technically you could tie in right here if you had some extra batteries. But again, I would isolate them with a fuse. Also something else to note, this these are 600 amp bus bars like I mentioned. So there's six 100 amp hour batteries in here. And technically, if you were to pull all of them at their limit, these bus bars can support that. So if you're tying in with something else and you have plenty of inverter power, you could exceed that. So there's, it would, it's unlikely that you're going to go over 600 amp with your inverters, but some people have large systems. So that's something to keep in mind, too. That's why I like those 1,000 amp bus bars that I have in the center over there. I'm never going to exceed that with the inverters I have. And the last thing I wanted to cover is use your pre-charge resistors. VATRA batteries don't come with them, but the Eco-Worthy battery has an automatic one in there. All EG4 batteries have pre-charge resistors in them. Learn how to use them. Read up on the manual on how to use those pre-charge resistors for your inverters, whether it be an EG4 inverter or another type. Usually that's done by engaging the breaker first. So you're going to turn the breaker on first or close the breaker then you will turn the BMS button on. So many people <laughs> turn, turn the BMS on, they have everything on, and then they throw that breaker at the end. They can't see a visible spark, but trust me, something's going on inside the inverter. If your battery doesn't have a pre-charge resistor, then you can use one like this. They're cheap on Amazon, not hard to come by. There's all kinds of different types. There's ones with, this, this is ceramic here. It is like the cheapest type but you can have some that are ceramic with a plastic surround. You can even use a pencil. So just like I was saying, buy a cheap resistor on Amazon. You can get a like a four pack for almost nothing. But if you don't have one, this pencil, the graphite in it will act as a resistor. Battery's already on. I've got the 6000 XP over me on too, so you should hear it beep, but you guys might be able to make out a spark. Let's see if we can, yep. And that's gonna act as a resistor you guys hear it beep? But yeah, I've gone into detail on how to use the pre-charge resistor in the batteries in the past. But yeah, remember, breaker first, breaker on the inverter first, then switch on the BMS. The battery will take care of it. Do one battery first, then you can switch the on button on the inverter, and then turn all the rest of the batteries on. Very simple. So guys, I hope this video helped. If you have any questions about anything else, feel free to leave it in the comments below. I'm trying to write these down and uh, categorize those frequently asked questions. So like I said, I can do maybe once a month, do a video on it. All right, guys. Well, thank you for watching and stay tuned.